on emerging science for environmental health decisions, and I welcome you to this day and a half workshop. Um, really excited about this topic on the promise of single cell and single molecule analysis tools to advance environmental health research. I want to welcome the people online. We have a, a large audience online signed up, and you know those of you who are speakers here, just be aware of that to uh, try to include them. If they have questions, uh, those questions will be shuttled to you. Um, so what is this standing committee about? Uh, we've been in existence for over a decade, uh, supported by the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. Our role is uh, to facilitate communication among a government, industry, environment, and NGOs, and the academic community bring forth the emerging science that uh, is happening more and more rapidly uh, out in the scientific communities and make that available to our environmental health researchers, regulators, and informed audiences. Um, so the advances, as a committee, we're looking for advances in tools, techniques, thought processes, uh, frameworks that are going to be helpful and informative in the process of making environmental health decisions. And as I said, this is an activity that's been supported throughout by NIEHS. So the standing committee, um, I'm co-chair with Melissa Perry uh, uh, on this committee. And it's a committee that uh, has, as I said, been in existence for a good time. Lisa Alward, Weishui Chu, Kevin Elliott, Christy Polinifedinik, Gary Ginsburg, uh, Norb Kaminsky, Margaret Karagas, Patrick McMullen, Gary Miller, Reza Rosalpour, Gina Solomon, and uh, Bill Farland. And if you look at the names of the locations where these individuals are, you can see there's a wide representation of industry, academia, NGO, uh, and informed audiences that help us in our decision-making process to identify important emerging science that uh, we want to share with the research committee community. So uh, here are some examples of past uh, workshops that we have sponsored. Um, and the process is that the standing committee goes through a horizon, horizon scanning effort to see what is emerging, identifies topics, thinks about those uh, over a period of a year or a year and a half to uh, form them into a workshop that's going to be helpful uh, to all involved, and then presents that workshop in this kind of venue uh, here. So in the past, uh, we've had workshops on uh, genomic plasticity. Uh, we've had workshops on the exposome, on the microbiome in environmental health, uh, individual variability, uh, and susceptibility, and a large number of other topics. So uh, a couple dozen or more workshop topics over the years. Um, so this workshop. Uh, came about because of our observation that the emerging science on, the, on single cell and single molecule analysis is rapidly becoming applicable uh, in general science, hasn't made much of an inroad yet into environmental health sciences, and we wanted to expose our community uh, to this opportunity that is made available by uh, this technique and these tools. Um, there was a working group uh, that identified speakers uh, for this workshop. Norb Kamensky uh, chaired that group. Uh, the other members of the committee, Lisa Alward, uh, Shudan Bhattacharya, myself, Salim Unlu, and Ramnik Xavier, all participated. And this was actually a very uh, active committee process. We had weekly phone calls for the last three months or so. And we were helped uh, very much by uh, Andrea Hodg Hodgkins, who, did I say your name right? Hodgson. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who, you know, really steered the, you know, the effort uh, and contacted many of you who are speakers here 
uh, and made this workshop really possible. Uh, we've also been supported by uh, the staff here at the National Academy of Sciences and particularly uh, the staff dedicated to our standing committee, Keegan Sawyer uh, and Elizabeth Boyle. Uh, and Jessica Demoy. So uh, please, um, I hope you enjoy this workshop. We've done, you know, uh, you know, as best a job as we can to make it available to you. And I'm going to turn this over now to uh, Keegan to give us some house rules here. So good morning, everyone. I am so very pleased that you're all joining us today. I am the director for the Standing Committee on Emerging Science, on the use of emerging science for environmental health decisions. Um, one of the things we've done really unique with the Standing Committee this year is bring in expert staff to help coordinate the different types of workshops. This is Andrea Hodgson working with this one, so I just want to make sure we give her a round of applause for coming in to do this. Um, some housekeeping rules. This is a very special slide. It's You've been to conferences. Please silence your phones. We are recording on the web, so when you ask questions or when you're coming to speak, make sure you're using the microphone so that our web audience can hear us. Um, this is a public webcast. It's going to be recorded. The videos will be um, recorded and put it on the online after the fact so that you can share this with your colleagues, with your students, with others who would be interested in this topic. Um, please be mindful that the comments made here are attributed to the people who make them. They're not attributed to the National Academies or the Standing Committee. Um, we're not speaking on behalf of the Academies here, but we're here to share ideas and exchange um, in, in an informative discussion about these tools and their uses. Um, we do have a Twitter hashtag for those of you who tweet. You're more than welcome to tweet. It's ESEHD workshop, all in one. And a um, summary of all of these discussions will be published by the National Academies. It's a very brief summary. It should not stop you from using these videos and conversations in your own work, um, and we welcome you to do so. With that, let's begin our workshop with our first speaker. Dr. Birnbaum. <laughs> Frankly, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Linda Birnbaum, and I think Kim actually said a lot of the things I was going to say about the history of ESEHD, but it's really my pleasure to welcome you to, this is actually the 25th workshop, so I don't think you said that, but we've been, <laughs> <laughs> two, is, two is pretty close, um, of the emerging science. And I think what's really important to understand is that these workshops have really had an impact. Sometimes people think that if you don't do a consensus report, nothing comes out of the workshop. But in fact, the, um, this workshop has often led to, at least for our institute, spot, you know, putting out calls for proposals in these areas, sometimes RFAs, sometimes FOAs, but basically it's an area that we move into, and I, th I think that has a huge um, impact for the extramural community, as well as it has impact on how other federal agencies um, function. So, I don't know if there's anyone in this, in this room or on the web who isn't familiar with who we are, but we are the one part of NIH that is not headquartered in Bethesda, Maryland. So we have the pleasure of not being here, but being located in North Carolina, which actually has both opportunities and challenges um, for not being here. And we also um, are a little different than many of the institutes because we actually, in many ways, have a public health focus, and our our really emphasis is on preventing disease. If we understand what it is in the environment that impacts our health, hopefully we can do something about it. And we think it's better to have to, to prevent disease if you can rather than treat and cure it, um, which we also develop um, approaches for that as well. Um, we have not been the only sponsor of, the, of these programs over the last 25 years. Uh, EPA has joined us at least once. I'm not sure if more than that, but we would be always be happy to have other sponsors join us, which would enable us to enrich the programs and have uh, more opportunities as well. So I think that the topic today, the promise of single cell and single molecule analysis tools to advance environmental health research, is of great interest to us at NIEHS and more broadly to NIH as well. 
Um, many of our intramural laboratories employ single cell and single molecule analysis techniques, um, focusing on topics from stem cell differentiation to replication of mitochondrial um, DNA. We even host a single cell dynamics group um, focusing on how the environment influences expression heterogeneity in real time and how these impacts affect uh, tissue composition. Um, we are also one of 15 um, institutes and centers of NIH that participate in a small business innovation research grants program. So keep your eyes out for um, opportunities there on the development of highly innovative tools and technology for analysis of single cells. And if that's something that you would be interested in participating in, Dan Shaughnessy um, of NIEHS is the appropriate contact. But I, I always let people know, if you don't know who to contact, send me an email and I'll send it to the right place and get you in contact with the right person. Um, I'd really like to thank um, Keegan Sawyer, who was just in front of you, Andrea Hodgson, and Liz Boyle, who also managed this committee for their really terrific work and the, the organizing committee for this workshop, because it's got an amazing, exciting program. And like all of you, I am really looking forward to learning more about this topic and engaging in conversation about how environmental science health advances can be applied in real world decision making to improve the health of people in the US and around the world. So with that, I turn it back to, to Norb. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Linda, for those opening remarks. And um, let me see here. So um, what, I, what I'd like to do, again, is just welcome everybody to this workshop. And um, I didn't know Kim was going to have the slide. So I just, I just again, want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues on the committee for um, helping organize this uh, uh, very exciting workshop. And again, uh, thank you very much, Andrea, for all the support that we've gotten from you. Uh, so let me start out by um, just providing this very crude uh, example here of really the theme for the next day and a half. And uh, what I want to emphasize here is that the analyses that we're going to talk about bypass ensemble averaging. And so if, if we looked at population A and B and we just quantified the amount of purple in both of these populations, basically what we would conclude is that these two populations are identical. But in fact, if we look at the individual members of each of these populations, we see really tremendous difference. So for example, the majority of population A has no purple at all. And it almost looks like an all or none effect. Whereas we look at population B, we see that all the members have pretty much similar amount of purple, and um, it is expressed across the entire population. And so what really what I want to emphasize here is the importance of beginning to really look at individual cells and individual molecules. And so let's just start by maybe some very broad definitions. So when we're talking about single cell analysis, this is a study of genomic, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics at the single cell level. Likewise, single molecule analysis will provide direct information and behavior of single molecules. Quite honestly, single cell and single molecule analysis is really not that novel. We can go back to the late 1960s with the invention of the first uh, fluorescence-based flow cytometer. And quite honestly, flow cytometry has dominated single cell analysis for decades. Immunologists have used that instrument for a variety of purposes. And in fact, the applications of flow cytometry continue to grow. Likewise, if we look at single molecule analysis, um, we can really go back to probably at start um, looking at um, some of the very early patch clamp studies that were done um, looking at um, uh, ionotropic channels. 
Um, also, single molecule imaging dates back to the mid-1990s, um, studies of ATP hydrolysis. What is, what is novel is the tremendous um, advances that have been made in both single molecule and single cell analysis that have occurred over the last uh, number of years now, actually a few years. A lot of this really, I think, can be in some ways based back to what um, has been coined as the third revolution in bio biology or biological sciences, also often referred to as the convergence. And this is really the, the convergence of life sciences, uh, the physical sciences, mathematics, and engineering, and the combination of those disciplines to really begin to address some complex um, problems in the biological sciences. Clearly, the physical sciences and engineering have provided us exceptional tools that we're utilizing to, to make these advances in single molecule and single cell analysis. Uh, mathematics clearly has been important in data analysis, uh, computational modeling of biological systems, and all of this has really helped advance the, these fields of single molecule and single cell analysis. Um, you know, if we look at single molecule analysis, the advances in ultra-sensitive microscopy, spectroscopy instrumentation and techniques, the way we use fluorescent probes instead of utilizing the entire spectrum, the visible light spectrum, so that we can now um, visualize things at the nanoscale. Um, and likewise, in single cell analysis, just to provide a couple of examples here, Next generation sequencing has really propelled this area, and our ability to barcode RNA transcripts from a large number of cells simultaneously, and then actually be able to analyze a transcriptome, transcriptome and be able to reconstruct that on an individual cell basis. I mean, these are things that we didn't believe we could even do a decade ago. Utilizing these tools has really challenged some of the basic premises and assumptions that folks have made in the biological sciences. Um, for example, the assumption that um, cell type has, uh, each cell type has a distinct lineage and function, and if you put, it, put these cells into the same environment, they'll behave similarly. Well, in fact, um, we know that cells can be morphologically and genetically identical, and yet um, when we view them, analyze them, study them, they can be dramatically heterogeneous. And it's that heterogeneity among these individual cells that can also then change the behavior of entire populations. And so really to understand uh, populations and the heterogeneity of these cellular populations, one really needs to study this at an individual cell basis. Similarly, even studying cell-cell interactions um, is critically important at the single cell level. So over the next day and a half, you will hear about some of the applications of single cell and single molecule analysis. So in terms of single cell analysis, um, this is really helping us develop an understanding of cellular networks within organ systems and tissues. Uh, we begin to define the cellular heterogeneity. And in fact, this is even moving a step forward to define that heterogeneity in the context, um, spatial context of tissues. Um, we can use these tools to identify novel cell types characterize different stages of cellular development and ma maturity, differentiation. And importantly, we can also use these tools to begin to study and, um, and the treatment of disease processes. Likewise, single molecule analysis provides us an ability to begin to study molecules not only in vitro, but most recently in intact living cells. So we can study the spatial movements of molecules, the path, the rate of conformational change, the distribution of these molecules across the cell. 
molecule-molecule interactions, the kinetics of movement, as well as study complex biological machinery. And again, maybe most important, we're beginning to use these single molecule analyses for diagnostic purposes. So we've been able to uh, tremendously increase the resolution and sensitivity, the precision of these measurements. And so again, utilizing um, single molecule analysis for biomarkers of disease um, appears to be a very promising new area of discovery. So in terms of the workshop objectives, uh, we're going to explore the current state of the technology, the toolbox that is currently available for these types of measurements. Uh, we'll provide examples how single cell, single molecule analysis has been applied to advance basic understanding of underlying biology. And as with any rapidly ex uh, changing area, we certainly want to look at the challenges, the barriers, and the limitations of the technology as it stands currently. And then lastly, um, to really uh, circle back to the mission of this workshop and also of the standing committee is to discuss the applications um, of these technologies for advancing environmental health sciences. And so I, I really look forward to this day and a half. We have just an exceptional um, slate of speakers. These are all folks that are leaders in their respective areas, and um, I think we will learn a lot over the day and a half. Uh, so with that, I think I'll turn it over to Dr. Romney Xavier from the uh, Broad Institute, and he will moderate this uh, first session.